So a guy, he goes to a guy and says, well, you know, do you believe I can do this? He goes to a smaller building. He says, I know you can do this, a piece of cake. You already did night before. You already did this. He said, you, you believe me I can do this? He said, absolutely. I bet my life on it. He said, okay, so why don't you get in the wheelbarrow and I'll take you across. <laughs> You think he had enough faith to get out of the middle wheelbarrow? No. Would you? No. No. <laughs> but that's the kind of faith we're talking about. That you know without a doubt the, the, the three uh, Hebrew boys that were, if you if deny, he says, if you don't deny Christ, we're going to throw you in a fire. That is faith. Were they worried about getting burned? No. I would. I would. Right? But the idea it wasn't a matter of what they felt. It has nothing to do with the feeling, whether it comes through or not. So when we talk about this, you need foundation. So let's get the foundation before we go there. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of John 1.1. 1, 1. I need you this week, because we're moving into the next phase of fasting. I need us to really work on these particular scriptures I'm going to give you today. You need to study these scriptures from... Now to the day sun, Easter Sunday comes. I'm going to give you these scripture verses. And I need you to really make them thorough in your walk right now. So I'm going to give you some scriptures that you're going to have to sort of take responsibility for. Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 80. It is that sent you that at home, as a study, you start preparing what that's about. It starts there. Who knows where, what, what's talk, what that talks about? In Luke. Alright? You're going to talk about Zechariah, Mary, Elizabeth. Those are the characters in that particular story. And then after Luke, you need to focus on the book of John. Essential for this foundation. Moving in our fasting season here. Chapter 13, verse 1. All the way to verse, to chapter 21. Verse 25. So you have a lot of chapters there. Chapter 13 in the book of John, starting that first verse all the way to chapter 21. <clears throat> this is foundational. Today, we're going to read right now John 1 1. Who wants to start that off? Who, who has it there? The Lord was first, and the Word presented to God. God presented. Alright. Any other translation? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's right. In the beginning, who? Who's it referring to? Jesus. Say it again. Who's it referring to? Jesus. Jesus. Alright? The Word is... Who is he? God. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. Verse 3, God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word, who? Jesus, gave life to what? Everything that was created. Foundation. And... The darkness can never extinguish it. Amen. Which means what? No evil, no device the enemy can use can defeat God, the Word, your truth. Now, if the Word becomes your truth that lives in you, what power do you have? Ready? What power do you have? You see, there are things that we all go through. In this world, we're going to have trouble. That's, the Word tells you that. But there's a purpose for that. You see? Now, we're going to be moving forward. Let me finish this part of the scripture verse in John. Because I said, verse 6 in the book of John, 1, 1, 1, 6. God sent man, John the Baptist, which you'll read in the book of Luke that I have you study. And you're going to understand where that falls into place there. To tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony, John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness 
to tell about the light. Now you know what's going on in the book of John 1 John? Here is, John is talking to the Hebrews and the Greeks. The word that was spoken in that time was Greek. So you had the Greek mythology going on in this whole system right now. So who is he referring to? God being the word that created everything. So everyone that's Greek and believes in all this mystical stuff, now had a problem with that. Now if you study it, you'll understand why. Why do they, they believe in a God of this and a God of that and a God of that? But what does the book of John, what does the name John mean? Anybody? The name John means son of thunder. Not Thor. <laughs> son of thunder. So now they, here comes up something they consider mystical. And now the word of God, the creator of all things, they had a problem. Now if you do history and you research this, you'll see why faith is so essential to our walk with God with our walk here in this life. Because the stuff we go through is minimal in comparison to what God has us to want us to do. But we're so distracted with the minimal things that happen in our lives, our dislikes, our little discomforts, our little things that don't fall into place the way we want them, and we have a hard time because it's really nothing in comparison. And we need to understand what God wants us to see. This is the truth about Jesus. Turn to someone. This is the truth about who? Jesus. Jesus. And the foundation of all truth. Yeah. And the foundation of all truth. That's right. What does that mean? Think about it. I want you to take a minute. What does that mean? If it says here, that's what the scripture is saying. This is the truth about Jesus and the foundation of of all truth. Let me see what you come up with when you hear that. What did that mean to you? Folks, if we cannot or do not believe this basic truth, then we are not going to get it. We're not going to have the faith to trust in our eternal destiny. You got 30 seconds. I want you guys to think through. Time is up. We start out. Who wants to go first here? Why don't you guys go first? What do you guys come up with? I didn't see you guys talking, but I guess you, you guys read it. The rest. Yeah. If you can spend the, the, your, the, your whole life building something, but unless it was built, on that foundation. Yes, brother. Absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. The beginning and the end uh, is God, Jesus, and He holds all truth. That's right. Amen. Absolutely right. Exactly that right. Yes. Um, he said that um, He brought everything in, into existence. So anything that is that comes up and tries to say that it's the truth or it's the way to go is a lie because he um, is the creator of everything, you know, and so when he speaks of what he says is the truth, is what to go by. That's right. And that truth, as the Bible we said many weeks ago, the truth that sets you free is that particular truth. He's in charge. You see, we can build our own kingdom and our own things in our own way, but unless it's founded on that foundation, it will crumble. Amen? All right. You guys excited yet? Because hey, here we go. We're going to really... And if you want more evidence of that particular truth, you go to John chapter 20, verse 30, and it will tell you that. But let's focus on God gives us power when we make the right choices. What kind of choices? When we choose to do, do it His way. What does it mean to do it God's way? Now, we have circumstances in our lives, okay? And God knows all about what's going on in your life. Turn to someone and say, God knows what's going on in your life. He knows what the little troubles you have, whether physical, whether emotional, whether uh, uh, relational, whatever the case may be, He knows what's going on in your life. It is not a surprise to Him. Can you guys understand that? Yeah. yeah. He knows everything about you. He knows when you have doubt. He knows when you are having trouble with 
But moving forward, he knows that. But that, what does he want with all of that? And this is very important because staying faithful under pressure is where it really lies. A lot of people don't stay faithful when circumstances come. They look for other ways to try to meet their needs. They think they have a solution. Isolating themselves, running away, finding other things to medicate. They find anything possible except going to the truth. His way, he gives us more power in our lives when we depend and trust in him. See, when your situation is impossible, that's when God says, you're right here. Now, he's not going to give you faith before you actually put it to work because then it won't work, it won't build. It's like you want muscle before you do a workout. How's that possible? How can you develop a muscle without working out first? A lot of us want the muscle first and then I can work out. You know, I get the push-up after I get the muscle. That sounds ridiculous, right? We are like that in our faith walk. We want to see it done before, you know, we actually do anything about it. And God's saying, you know what kind of people God blesses most? Anybody have any idea what kind of people God blesses most? It's the people who trust God completely. Completely. Not because I'm disappointed today. You know, we're always looking somewhere else to get it. I'm not getting what I need here. We're running away. And it has nothing to do with where you go because he's there wherever you go. But when you trust by faith, that God produces the enormous power in your life, then you're going to see. Turn to the book of Matthew. I'm going to show you a story here. Right now, this is a direct, what you, what you're going to have to sort of find out how do we have this, this kind of power functioning in our life. And in the book, Matthew 13, there's something that happens here. Okay? And I'm going to start up with verse uh, 50, I think it's 53. Right? Jesus just comes back from one place and comes to his home country, his hometown, and which is, what, what was his hometown? Nazareth. Nazareth, all right? Just so you know the history. Jesus comes from Nazareth, where he grew up. When Jesus had finished telling these stories, now, this is right before he's telling, he tells, how many parables does he tell right before here? He tells about, anybody have any parables? He tells these parables, and they call them stories. You know, and the disciples ask him, why are you telling them his stories? And he gives an explanation for that. And if you want to know, you're going to have to read it. But then here he goes. When Jesus had finished telling these stories and illustrations, he left that part of the, the country. He returned to Nazareth, his hometown. When he taught there in the synagogue, everyone was amazed and said, where does he get his wisdom and the power to do, do these miracles? Then they scoffed at him, which means what? Mocked him. Right? And he, he just, uh, he said, he's just a carpenter's, carpenter's son. And, and we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, Jane, Joseph, Simon, and, and you know, and Judas, and, and in verse 56, and all his sisters live uh, right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Now, he's doing miracles. Why would you refuse that? What could be going on in us to refuse things that are happening supernaturally around you? Right? But anyway, they did. And that's not the point here. I'm trying to get to a point. And here's the point after they refused him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and amongst his own family. He says in verse 58, and so he did only a few miracles there because of their unbelief. In some scriptures it says, because of their lack of faith. Now, he could have done a lot more miracles there, but he did. So what's the connection? What's the direct connection between faith and power? Yes? If we refuse to believe, then we won't have power. That's right. Okay, very good. Absolutely. If you cut yourself off from God, Okay, very good. Anybody else? Yes. You have to be willing to trust in God and for Him to perform the miracles in your life. You have to be willing to trust in Him and uh, uh, obey Him 
That's right. Now, but think about this a minute. Your situation can seem impossible, and what happens to a person when things they're in a situation where things seem impossible to change? Anxiety. Anxiety. What happens? Depression. Depression. That's it? Anger. Fear. Anger. Fear. Loss of hope. Loss of hope. You know, all these emotions take in. You're giving into the emotion of the moment at this point. Are those emotions real? Yes. Yes. They are real. So how do you handle that? When it comes to faith. See, because we want faith to be a feeling, and we're feeling this, then it doesn't work. You don't want to feel anxious. You want to, but that's not how faith works, does it? So let's, let's continue. I just want to throw this out there because the, 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 the connection between faith and power is that the more faith you put in God, the more you let your life and the more the power of your blessings you're going to get. All right. So now we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be talking about some things here because in, in that in that chapter right there in thirteen he 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 the, he's gone to Nazareth, their hometown, and Jesus did not do many miracles because of the, in his part in his hometown because of their lack of faith. Notice that connection there. You can either run through life on your own power, and a lot of us want to rely on our own strength, on our own understanding, on the things we can control. But if you rely on the things you can control, now what are some of the things you know you can control in this life? What are some of the things you know you can control in this life? Let me hear this. Yes. Sleep. Sleep. Okay. Really? All right, good. Okay. Yes. Your feelings? Your feelings? Okay, yes. Anybody else? My thoughts. Your thoughts. All right. Anybody else? Huh? Your reactions, okay? Anybody else? I thought about it, and frankly, I can't think of anything that I'm in control of. Your words. Why, why is that? Because I gave myself over to them, and I, I, I can't. Through experience, I tried. It doesn't work. Okay. I can't control anything. I want to get up every morning at 6.30, but <laughs> I'm, I'm still doing the 7 o'clock, so I, I'm not even in control of that. As God help me get up at 6.30. All right, all right, yes, very good, thank you. Yes? Your words. Your words. You can control your words, right? Well, well let's, let's find out when it says, uh, what's the secret to growing faith? If I ask you right now as a group to tell me the secret of growing faith, what would you say it is? Take a minute. Discuss it with the person next to you. If I ask you, tell me the secret of growing faith, and that's what we're going now. I'm going to give you four basic uh, approaches to growing your faith. All right? But I'm going to hear first which how you come about getting this. You need to grow in faith. Why you need to grow in faith in the first place? Okay? Because if we can't do God the, the, what God calls us to do unless we grow in that particular faith. All right? A lot of people want to do a lot of things. I had an individual come to me the other day. They're going on a mission trip. And they're not, they're not, they are very afraid because they know, that they, they don't know why they're afraid. You know, they just want to know why, why is it that I'm feeling this? You know, because they're going to a part of the country that is very hostile towards Christians. You know? So now they're going afraid. All right? They don't think they're living right. Enough. He says, well, what, what I asked him, well, why are you going over there in the first place? You know, do you feel God calling you to do that? No, oh, well, my church is doing that. They're calling us. I want to be right with God. I want to do all these things. But they're, oh, they, they not, I don't feel equipped to go. So now they're coming to look for help to say, what, what do I need to do? So the question to you, what is the secret to growing faith? Can we talk about it? You got 30 seconds. I'm going to make you talk, think, process. This is important. Remember, don't forget the foundations. All right, you got 10 seconds. 
And we're gonna get into it. Oh man, I got time. All right. Your time is up. All right. First, Anthony. Getting uh, uh, rid of your fears and uh, believing in God. Believe, believing in God will produce uh, and also uh, uh, not fearing the unknown. Okay. A lot of good stuff there. Anybody else? Yes. You know, it's based on divine hearing, right? So I personally, I can only give you my own personal account. Yeah. Um, I tried it. I tried it all. Doesn't work. Nothing works. I turn to the word of God and that mm -hmm. seems to be working. And when it starts working, my faith starts increasing. Because I tried it all. Nothing is satisfying. Nothing works. Okay. Except going to God. That works for me. Amen. It increases my faith. Amen. Hallelujah. For me, I, I, I use an illustration for to know that faith cometh by hearing continually. I use a car. I fill up the tank with gas and I use the car, but unless I keep filling the tank up with, car, with, with gas, I cannot any longer use it. Great analogy. I love it. You got to keep filling the tank. Yes, anybody else here? The guy's not talking at all. Are you with me? <laughs> Are you with me? Yes. All right. Let's stay, let's, stay, let's stay with the program. All right. So we're going to talk about you, you, you grow in faith when you believe God's dream for your life. God's purpose for your life. What is God's purpose for your life? Now, sometimes, and I'm going to use a story in the book of Genesis, chapter 37, and sometimes the dream and the vision or the calling that God places on us, we don't see it like a dream, like a vision, like a calling. We don't see it at all. We don't even have a clue that we are in that journey. Well, I'm going to use a story, and I can use many stories, because a lot of the people in the Bible didn't even know they were called for that. Amen. David was anointed to be king, and he still was functioning, was, didn't, didn't have a clue. But I'm not going to use that analogy today. I'm going to use the one in the chapter 37 of the book of Genesis. And who's that talking about? Joseph. Joseph. All right? Now think about how this starts. And then you tell me, why, how does this manifest? How does this start this process? Because the process doesn't start very well, does it? Now here's the story. If you don't know it, we're going to read it. Anybody wants to read it loud? I mean, if you want to read it loud, I can get someone who can actually want to actually do that. Anybody? You want the whole power? Well, I want, I'm going to break it down. Like, for example, in the beginning it says, So Jacob settled against in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as a foreigner. And that's an important fact there, number one fact. But here it goes. And it says, This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended, his father's, uh, tended to his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, and he gives the name of all those wives, right? Verse 3, Jacob loved Joseph more than any other children because Joseph was what? The son of his own age. He was a, this is a baby. Now, you know, this is something that causes a lot of problems usually in a lot of cultures. Favoritism. You know, it's going to happen in a lot of cases. You know, some are more favored, you know, for whatever reason. You know, that's just going to happen. But here, Joseph, he is the youngest, and now God chooses Joseph. What does he do to Joseph that affects his life? And because he's favored, you know, everybody wore robes back then, but his father gave Joseph a particular robe that is fit for a king in the first place. That, and he showed his brothers that he was favored. You know, all the other brothers didn't like it and so they were jealous of Joseph. They really hated Joseph. Alright? And that's what they describes there in the beautiful robe he gave him. But in verse 4, but the brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. We're talking about ten brothers and every one of them 
Now, what's the chances of every one of those brothers hating me? What are the chances of all of them hating you? Very rare. But it happened. But what does God do with Joseph? Now he gives Joseph a dream. Now here's where it comes in. Does Joseph have even a clue of what is going on? Because the, clue, the dream must have been so powerful to be able to share it with his brother. Who wants to read that part? Who wants to read that part, what he says to his brothers? The dream? Yeah. Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, and suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright. When your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. No. You got a dream like that, I mean, he either had near the interpretation of the dream or he didn't have a clue, right? Because, you know, does he even know that his brothers don't like him? No. I mean, think about it a minute. You know, you're around 10 brothers and they all, they said, the Bible's very clear, they don't talk nice to him, they mistreat him. Right. You know, but a brother, younger brother like that wants to look up to his brothers, no matter how they treat him. This is just practical, makes no sense. Right? But the point here, you know, he's getting this negative negativity from his brothers, yet he still looks up to them. He's still telling them his dream, although he's a little immature about what it means. So God gives him this dream, and then he gives him a second dream. Well, tell me to carry read the second dream. Oh. Because then he had, I'm sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said. I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Now, after the first dream, they hated him all. Here comes another dream. Now, he can't seem to help himself because God's already calling him. He doesn't see this as a calling, by the way. Do you know it's a calling? How do we know it's a calling? You probably say, it can't be a calling. How can it start, how can it start off with all that hate, and with all that mess, with all this stuff that's happening to him? How could that even be good? It was good. But it's hard to see it as good when all this negativity is happening to him. See, when things are happening in our lives that we don't like, we don't see it as good, we, we miss the point. Because who's in control? God. God's in control, folks. He's in control of your circumstances. He's in control of what's going on in your life, in your body, in your finances, in everything. He's in control. God bless you. Then he gets up. The, the dream he tells his father. He wants to read the dream he tells his father. Listen to what he says to his father. Read it. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream? Am I reading the right? Yeah, yeah. What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Did he get in trouble? Yes, father. Folks, did he get in trouble? Yes. yes. And who gave him the dream? God. God. Who caused his circumstances? God. God. Yeah. So, did Joseph have a clue? Folks, it all starts with a vision for your life. And sometimes you don't see that God has a particular vision and calling on your life. Now, your circumstances may not be good. It may not look good, feel good. It may not be working the way you envision it in your own mind. But God has a purpose and a plan for you. Turn to someone and say, God has a plan and a purpose for you. He's already giving you a dream. He's already giving you a vision. He's already calling you. If you're here listening to this message, He's given it to you already. All we need to do is grow in our faith. How do we grow in our faith? It tells you clearly by hearing and hearing the word of God. Well, what does that really mean? That means I need to have a relationship Jesus. with Jesus. Amen. Turn to someone. I need to have a relationship with Jesus. He has to be everything to me. See, that's what it's actually saying in practical sense. Have that relationship with Him. Fill your tent. Talk to Him often. Have a relationship. Now don't go and just go, God, I need this. Help me with that. I'm praying on you. Thank you, Jesus. And see you later. Is that a relationship, folks? 
No, we want it that easy. We just want that. You know? Is it, do you go to your house, your house if you have a, a, a spouse and you say, honey, make me meal, do this and do that, and that's it? You know, God, thank you for the meal, goodbye? What, do you do that in a relationship? No. no. What does it take? What does it take? Time. Commitment. It takes giving your time, effort, talking, relating, communicating, being able to get into that. When I ask you to read those scripture verses I gave you in the beginning, you need to look at that as a relationship. Find out what the Lord is saying to you in that scripture verse. Study it. We're going to learn to study it. We're going to give you words you need to start hearing. But if it comes in here and goes out the other way, but it starts here with vision, mission, calling. This is important. What does God want to do with your life? Read Proverbs 29, 18. All right? Here it is. Proverbs 20, what? 9, 9 verse 18. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, you have a vision God has given you. You have a calling God has placed in your life. There is no doubt. Who doubts that? Everybody here knows that you have a purpose? A vision? A calling? Let me hear the see the hands. I want to make sure you understand. All right. Because if you don't, the nine saints, we have Proverbs telling where there is no vision. Now, who are people who have no vision? No call. What do you refer to a person who has no purpose? A fool? A fool? Blind. Religious leaders were blind. They knew a lot of words. They were fools. They couldn't get it. And a lot of times, God wants to prepare us to see. Now, when the troubles come, we just easily swept away. Ask the Lord for a vision, folks, in your, for your life. Ask the Lord for the vision for your finances, for your health, for your relationship. Ask Him for a vision in that. Now, I love the story of Nehemiah. It's powerful because he had a vision and a purpose. I love, I ask God all the time, I need to see the vision like Nehemiah saw it. I, I want to be able to have clarity. Like Moses saw it. He knew, go to Egypt, go to Pharaoh. I know when God tells me to do that, that's great. I would love that. Nehemiah knew. But even though Nehemiah knew, God provided everything he needed. But he had so much opposition with the very people he was supposed to help. The people that he was trying to help him, he want to do this for, they were resisting. So what do you do? Moses had ended up smiting a rock. Instead of talking to God out of his frustration. Don't rely on people whether they do or not do. You have a purpose and a vision God has given you. Just because it doesn't turn out the way you want it, doesn't mean God is not working in it. Amen. God works all things to those who watch. This is by, no matter how you see it now functioning the way you want it, he is working his truth in it because you what? You believe in that truth. You don't rely on these things. You understand? Yes. If we're going to go forward, you can't do that. I'm going to have to speed up. You must be responsible. Turn to someone. You must be responsible for yourself. You must be responsible for yourself. You cannot delegate getting better to someone else, folks. It's time to develop the kind of faith you need right now. The Bible says you can do all things to Christ who what? Strengthens you. You have to own your own development by envisioning and getting better and having faith that God will help you bring it to a path. Now take a circumstance in your life that you would like to see God manifest that truth. As if it's done. May not see it at the moment, but it's a done deal. So we need to start visioning what that is. You can't trust him a little. You see? Uh, uh, trust him uh, just a little. Or just trust him a lot. 
You have to sort of understand this is about getting to a relationship where you know God is faithful no matter what. Turn to someone. God is faithful no matter what. God is faithful no matter what. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. God, by His mighty power at work within us, is able to do more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of. Infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. God is faithful. Yes, He is. So why would He allow something to, something to continue in your life? Now you probably asked that. I've been faithful this, this, this. Why is it still there? Because you're acting the wrong thing. You're hearing the wrong thing. You're feeling the wrong thing. But doesn't say don't not to ask, because he says dare to ask him. Ask, you see, but a lot of times we're asking out of our own fear and not faith. We already defeated. We have to let the enemy steal the hope that he has already given you. Wow. Take it back. Thank you. Take, take it, back. it back. It's time to take it back. Thank you. Thank you. Don't limit yourself. God doesn't want you to limit yourself. Turn to someone. Don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself. Yeah. It's time to use the awesome power that God has given us in our faith. Amen? Amen. Let it motivate you. Motivate. To pray more, believe more, trust more. We could do all those things, and, but we want to get to that relationship. This past week, we started with fasting sugar. You know, <coughs> I don't want you to think about this ritual. It's about a commitment. Now we're going to fast not only sugar, but the meat. <coughs> Red meat. All right? But remember the scriptures I gave you in the beginning. In Luke and in John. This is your study. This is what you're going to put in place. Because when we get into uh, fasting activities, we're going to be able to incorporate these particular studies into it. Today's impossibility is tomorrow's possibility. Believe God's promises, folks. The Bible says, I am the Lord, the God of all people, of all the world. Is anything too hard for him? Yeah. Nothing. Say, turn to someone, nothing is impossible. Yeah. God is the God of the impossible. Turn to someone, God is the impossible. Yeah. Just because your dreams seem impossible doesn't mean you should go after it. That's how God, God's, uh, how faith works. Faith always works in the realm of the impossible. The more attainable you think it is, the less faith is required. You see, the more you think you're in control that you can do it, the less the faith is required. Hello. When you're in a worse situation, you're going to require more faith. Yes. See? But we, we don't like to work hard. We are intimidated with that. Sometimes faith to us is the we rely on the tangible. How do we try to make a, we try to make it physical, you know? It's not about that. This is a spiritual situation here. When you envision and ask God for help, to help you bring the dream to pass, we will show, He will show you who, what, how, when, and where. Sometimes we're not even sensitive to that. Verb nine, number two, that was one. I'm gonna go through the other three really fast, and here goes two. You grow in faith when you are uh, willing to take risk. Risk. That's major. Pastor. What happened? That's major. Yeah. When you're willing to take risk. Because if you don't take any risk, why don't we take risk in the first place? Fear. Fear. See, that was a break us out of our complacencies. And a lot of times, our faith, our religion has become, become complacent. That we don't step out. The class that we're teaching with faith, uh, evangelism, these are things to help you stretch, to get outside of yourself. Sometimes we just, oh, we've done all the classes. I've done all these things. We're going to always be doing classes. We're going to always be helping you to develop. We're going to always be helping you to grow so that we are making disciples. And in part, when we impart it to you, you are to impart it in others. Your responsibility is to make disciples. What does that yeah. mean? Acts 15. They risk their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't risk your life for Him at this point, what's the point? 
You're going to have to take a risk. Failure is no big deal. Turn to someone. Failure is no big deal. Failure, Failure is no big deal. big deal. You probably say, what? Because we don't like to fail. Yes. Failure is a part of growth. It's what helps you grow. So in order to experience failure, you have to what? Take a risk. Don't just want to take a risk. Now don't just go and say, I'm going to jump off this building you know, to see if I can make it and you know, catch me and other stuff like that. But think about the kind of risk you use wisdom. Use wisdom. That's how you learn. Don't call mis uh, missteps or mistakes a failure. Call it, call it a learning lesson. You're never going to disciple or be disciplined by God for trying to do the right thing, folks. We all need to grow. Now, I, I think earlier I told you about Nebuchadnezzar was threatening the three Jewish guys going to the fire. And here, it, it, it's almost like the way the enemy tries to steal your hope and your joy and your peace. He tries to create a situation in your life that's going to destroy you. You feel like this is the end of your job, I could lose my job, or I can do this. If I speak up for a race, or I might get fired, or if I take a stand against something that, if I, don't, if I say Jesus is my soul, you might think they're going to make fun of you. All these things is what happens in a practical sense. It's no different than going into the fire the furnace. Because the Hebrew boy says, even if they do that, my God. Say, my God. My God. My God. My God. We'll take care of you. We'll take care of you. See, that's faith. But we won't take the chance because of whatever. Real faith will trust God even, even if it involves risk. Even if it seems like God won't answer or rescue. Real faith commits to God's plan because it's the right thing to do. We won't confront the loved one because of oh, what's going to happen. No, my faith in him is what's first. I don't care what the circumstances or what the consequences will be. Go after your dream, folks, in spite of the negative talk, in spite of others' doubts. You're never going to fail until you, you quit. Failure is failing to try. Judges, failure is failing to try. Failure is failing to try. Discouragement or pride will keep you from serving God's purpose, folks. Galatians 6 4. Each one should test his own action. Listen to this. Each one should test his own action. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself with someone else. Make sure you are doing this just before you and the Lord. Not about you and competing with anyone else. Let go of fear of failure, folks. Because anything you do, uh, you're, you're, attempting to, you're attempting to do for God's love and faith. God says that's a good thing. Three, you grow in faith when you expect God to bless you. Alright? Turn to someone and repeat this. You grow in faith when you expect God to bless you. You. Well, I want to rephrase that a little bit. I'm going to say to bless and use you. That's better, right? Yes. To bless and use you. But he can't use you unless you what? Take risks. Right. Unless you're willing to take the chance. Paul in Philippians says, I expect and hope that I will not fail Christ in anything, but that I will have the courage now to show the greatness of Christ in my life here on earth, whether I live or die. Paul says, I expect God to bless me. So did David, and so did a lot of others. I believe I should enjoy the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Amen. We need to take chances. A part of me don't want to. I'm afraid to. I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to do this. Well, that's where now your faith has to grow. It's not going to grow when you're doing something you're good at. Or comfortable with. If you go through the Bible, you'll find that everybody blesses 
uh, everybody blesses in a great way is because they expect God to bless them. Expecting God is an act of faith. Again, expecting God is an act of faith. This is important. God moves on us because somebody believes. Expect God to move in your behalf. The Bible says, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. Based on what you decide to do. Okay, we're going to be closing now. I'll give you the last point. So when it comes to your finances, to your health, and to any of those things, that's what you need to God, expect God to move on your behalf. The difference between winners and losers is always attitude. 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 Four. So what are we believing for? What are you expecting God to do in your life this, right now, moving forward? And here's the, 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 the fourth and the final step. Growing in faith means never giving up. Turn to someone. Never giving up. Be strong and courageous. You know, when I was at my worst, my worst situation I could ever confront in life, I was out of my control. There was nothing I could do. And in my prayer time, it was, it was devastating because it was, I mean, I, I can see when Jesus said he bled, uh, he sweated blood because it was hard. Can't sleep, can't stand up, couldn't do nothing. That's, right. That's, right. That's how hard it was. And I had to talk to them. You said in your word, remind them, you said your promise, where is it? Where what, is what was going on here? Why am I in this place? You know, I couldn't do anything else. And he took the cleanest day showed me, well, when, when, when I called you know, David to do this, well, he went through all of that. Did I forsake him? No. I said, when, when, when I called Joshua to take over for, for Moses, what did I tell him? And he tells me, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. He, God tells him that three times. The people tell him that, and we need to be what? Strong, Strong and courageous. And courageous. <laughs> Never give up. Psalm 118 says, and my, my life hangs in the balance, but I will not give up obedience to your word. I will not give up obedience. Let's look at it close, guys. How do you grow in faith? Ask God. Help me, Lord. Help me with my unbelief. Start reading his word, folks. Amen. A man came, uh, uh, um, a man came to Jesus and his child, because his child was sick. Says, he says to him, uh, uh, the father cries out and he says in tears, Lord, I, I believe, help me with my unbelief. But that's because he told Jesus if you can. And Jesus says to him, if I can. If I can, and he says, "Listen, forgive me, forgive me for that. Forgive me, but help me, even though I have that part of me struggling with that. Yes. Doesn't mean you're not going to struggle with the things you're going through in life. It's going against that right now, but we want to experience this awesome power of faith. So let's trust Him. Let's power heads.